Hello everybody, I am Famine Cho, and today we're going to be talking about Made in Abyss Season 2, Episode 7, The Cradle of Desire. So this episode was quite disturbing, to be honest. Probably uh, the darkest episode of Made in Abyss yet. And you'll have to forgive me here, but I'm still kind of reeling in from it. Uh, I'm recording this pretty late at night. This is a, a, a late, you know, reaction slash review to this week's episode. Normally I like to get these out the day of, but IRL things had to uh, intervene. But yeah, this episode definitely uh, shook me a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm still kind of in that place right now. I'm still in this episode. I'm still uh, very much trying to wrap my head around a lot of the themes and... Uh, God, that ending. What, what in the world? So, my big takeaway from this episode is Wazukyan. I really, really, really like Wazukyan. I think I put a note down in my phone as I was watching. Yeah, I did. Wazukyan fucking rules. I wrote that in my phone. Uh, he does. I, I love sort of the beginning of this episode when he's giving this speech. I, I believe I wrote this down as well. He says, uh, we now find ourselves in a legend. Par probably paraphrasing. <laughs> Uh, I really, really like that opening dialogue. I really love this speech he makes uh, as sort of a leader uh, of, of the Three Sages, of this group, of these settlers that come to the Golden City. Uh, we find ourselves in a legend. It's time to prevail. It's time to uh, make haste. And, and, you know, he's being a leader. He's being inspiring and he's doing this. But then further along the episode, in the back half of the episode, he makes another speech that basically says... Uh, we're kind of doomed, you know, we're dying. This might be it, guys, but let's have hope and let's rally behind uh, Iremui and, and her wish or whatever. And I just really love that juxtaposition of Wazukan from the beginning of the episode uh, to the end of the episode. We'll talk about the end of the episode. We'll definitely talk about the end of the episode. A couple of other notes that I wrote down before we get into the thick of it is the fact that the interference units exist existed before... The settlers arrived before the three sages arrived in the sixth layer. Uh, I always assumed that the humans that traveled to the abyss, you know, hundreds of years ago, created these uh, dolls, created the interference units, but that's, we now know that that is not the case. So my theory is now out the window. I always assumed that Liza had something to do with the creation of these things, or at least the creation of Reg. I, I still think that that theory could stand. She still could have created Reg. Uh, we see in this episode that these, uh, Interference units are a bit more uh, machine-based. They don't take a lot of uh, human features as, say, Reg or even uh, the big daddy dude that we see hanging around Faputa. Uh, these are much more, you know, mechanical, you know, robot dudes. And um, I kind of dig that. Uh, we see in the episode that they're willing to learn. You know, they, they want to learn speech patterns and, and, and characteristics of these humans. And, and they want to be a part. You know, they're not standoffish. They're not scared. They really want to learn about their culture. And they're open to teaching them about theirs and about what's going on here in this abyss. They're helping them find water and that sort. I'm just curious, like, what, what are these interference units? Who put them there? I mean, they're here to protect a specific layer. They're they're doing their job essentially, but I'm just curious, like, what's going on there? So th there's settlers that are even before them, perhaps. I have no idea. I have no clue, and I, I really think that that just introducing them here really spins a lot of my theories that I've had about the 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 greater overall arcing story around this series, or just the, the very creation of the abyss and what's going on and what truly is happening here. It's really spun that on its head quite a bit. Uh, and I thought that was interesting. I really did. Secondly, something else that I found very interesting is the fact that we see a, a very midi-like creature use a very white whistle-like stone uh, to bring them down into the Golden City, uh, to use the elevator that goes down into the sixth layer. Uh, I, I don't know how that happened, like how this creature existed. Uh, I don't know like where this creature came from. I always assumed, again, that Bon Drood was responsible for the creation of these creatures. I always assumed that, like, oh, he's the one that came up with that, but maybe the elevator did this to them naturally? We see Bon Drood, you know, experimenting with the elevator thing, with, you know, splitting the abyss curse in half, and one side gets it worse, and the other side just gets, you know, furry, basically. Uh, I'm curious if, like, maybe this elevator is doing that naturally, and when they go down in the elevator, they just become this thing essentially so i'm or go back up i should say but i'm really curious like 
is that something that they're going to touch on later? Maybe this is where Bondrude got the idea for his experiment. Like, what if we could split that and have someone not take on the whole curse of the abyss? Like, maybe that's sort of where he got this idea. He is hanging around, hanging out in those uh, areas of the abyss. So perhaps that, or maybe it's just a throwaway. Like, I don't really know. There is, again, as I mentioned, a, a white whistle like stone. I don't know where that comes from. I'm assuming there's people that have come to the abyss before. Uh, the three sages. I, I obviously think that that's the case. I, I think that Iram Yui's people have been down here before and they talk about that in this episode, but I just never thought that it would go as far as to say that maybe they created the interference units. Maybe now that, you know, maybe now they're way more advanced than them. And I don't know. It, there's a lot of uh, interesting theories that kind of shifted and altered with this week's episode. Okay, as I mentioned at the top of the video, uh, this is the darkest episode yet. Uh, there are very, very disturbing things that happen in this episode. Uh, disturbing imagery. Disturbing sound design. Uh, very good uh, disturbing voice acting. <laughs> uh, I, I love this episode. I need to preface that before I go on. I really, really loved this episode. I thought it was fabulous. I thought it was one of the best episodes of the series. Uh, probably better than what I said was the best episode, to be honest with you. Uh, however... Main Abyss is gross, right? <laughs> it's really, really gross. There are some disturbing things, uh, shocking things that happen in this episode from horrid, uh, uh, you know, body mutilation, like straight up body horror. Like there's straight up body horror in this episode. It's like morphing toes and torn up arms and things of that sort. Uh, Iram Yui is giving birth to these weird babies and her gut is open and it's, it's fucking gross, man. It's so gross. And then there's the illness and the diarrhea and like, it's just so, it's so gross and disturbing. It's, it's one of the grossest anime I've ever seen for sure. However, as I mentioned, I, I'm still loving it. I, I'm still, I'm still in it. You know, I'm still following this story. I just think that when you play around with themes like this, when you play around with uh, imagery and storytelling like this, it's really easy to come across as... Uh, like, look at this shit. This is how, you know, dark and gritty we can get. Uh, this episode definitely did not feel like that at all. Uh, it definitely felt um, like our characters were going through very unfortunate things. Um, Hiram Yui uh, is a very, very... This whole episode had, like, Greek tragedy written all over it, in my opinion. Uh, Hiram Yui especially um, wishing on this egg uh, that grants wishes to children or... Uh, anyone can grant wishes from it, but it just happens to be more potent when a child makes this wish. Uh, and she, I'm assuming, wishes that she could bear children. And we learned that she cannot in this episode. And um, the moment between her and Vueco, I thought was very powerful uh, when they were, you know, in each other's arms and, and uh, Vueco was trying to console her. I, I thought that that was just a very strong character moment uh, for not just Uram Yui, but also Vueco. You know, we're, we're learning about Uram Yui through... Uh, a character that we already love in Vueco, and I, man, I just found a lot of that dialogue and, and a lot of that imagery very, very powerful. Uh, it was definitely a little tear-jerking, for sure. Uh, so she she wishes that she could bear children, so the Abyss does that. Uh, the only issue is these children uh, basically die immediately, and um, it's really hard to watch. <laughs> it's, it's really, really disturbing. Uh, the screams are very, very disturbing. Uh, and we see our characters tackling horrible illness, and Bailoff is now getting sick, and Wazukyan does not know what to do. And I'm assuming, now I could be wrong here, I'm, we, so <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. So we see, towards the end of this episode, we see Voiko, you know, dying of thirst, dying of hunger. Uh, her body is empty. She is on her deathbed, essentially. And, uh,. She, said, she has a sort of inner monologue where she says, like, I'm glad that Iram Yui got her wish. However, I just want water, dude. I just want to live. Like, that was the point of, of me giving you this egg, was for you to have us live prosperous, you know, to wish for such a thing. But she's, she, I think she, I think Waco feels a little bit betrayed that Iram Yui basically put her happiness before hers, before Waco's, and before uh, the rest of the village. I think there was sort of that sense in her, but she was still uh, happy for her in some way, but at the same time felt sorry for her because she was suffering. And I think that was kind of going through Wazukyan as well. Uh, Wazukyan had a lot of hope 
in uh, Irem Yui and, and thought that thought the same thing, essentially, that, that that would be our wish. You know, that would be the thing that that keeps us going. But it doesn't. And uh, basically everyone is dying and Irem Yui is suffering. And I think Wazu Kyan makes the executive decision to say no to that. Like, no, this we're done with this. Like, we're dying. She's suffering. There has to be a way out of this situation. And I think that his... I, I don't really know how you get to point A from point B where we decide to eat her. Because I'm assuming that that's what happened. And I, I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm, I'm still kind of reconciling with the fact that we 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 probably we ate Irem Yui. We ate her. Either that or we ate her babies, maybe? Maybe all those babies she was giving birth to were like giving us life? Or we ate Irem Yui because she now had this uh, uh, egg inside of her, essentially. She had this egg inside of her, uh, which has the power to grant wish wishes. And now that we eat her, eating the egg, and we're all on our deathbeds, the only thing that we wish for is life at that point, right? Like, when we're that close to death, the only thing we want is to live. And so everyone was able to live. That is my theory about this entire situation and about what happened. And I think Wazukyan again, made that executive decision. I think Wazukyan knew what he was doing there. Uh, this was the only option. And I think he knew that. I, I don't know, man. God, I love Wazukyan, dude. I absolutely love him in this episode. That final moment uh, on that cliffside between Vueco and him. Um, stellar, stellar shot, man. The background work in this episode is fantastic. And, and that particular shot is like one of the best in the entire series, to be honest. I love, I, I really have to applaud uh, the design of these characters. I love the way Wazukyan looks. I love Vueco's design. I love Irem Yui. Bailoff looks amazing. Like, I love the way these characters look. Um... So yeah, we ate Irem Yui, we ate the egg, and now we are granted life. That's my theory, at least. Now, where we go from here, I have no clue. Now, I... I don't know who Faputa is. I don't know who she is. I guess I, I assume that she was Irem Yui. Like that, and Irem Yui became her. But now that I'm like looking at these things, again, I am an anime-only watcher, and a naive one at that. So I don't fully, I'm not fully grasping like where is she coming from and what's happening there. I always assumed that, that that was just her, you know. But now I'm having even a harder time bridging the gap between the past and what's happening right now. Like how does Waco become chained? And we see the interference units mention value as soon as they get down there. They're like value, value. So like that's already something that is present in this city. It's not something that Wazukyan or Waco invented. Even though Vueco is in charge of the value ooze. Uh, I, I don't know how we get there, you know? And I, I want more. I want to learn more. Uh, maybe Irem Yui is not dead. Maybe we ate her babies. Maybe Wazukyan extracted the egg from her. I have no clue, man. We ate we ate her. We totally ate Irem Yui. I think that's what happened. <laughs> this episode was uh, chocked full of incredible moments. Uh, I should mention the soundtrack in this episode in particular. Uh, I would say more so than most of the episodes. Uh, was just absolutely spectacular. In the beginning, we hear these, like, very, like, light-hearted sort of, like, senses of adventure and mystery, a little bit of, like, a John Williams, like, Star Wars vibe kind of happening, and we, we've heard that stuff in this season. Uh, but then as, this, as the episode progresses, uh, the music gets a little bit more melancholic and gets a little darker and more disturbing, and I, I really found uh, Kevin Penkin's work on this episode to be um, some of the best uh, yet, for sure. At least how a lot of the OST was used in this episode. It honestly felt like this episode was, like, scored. Like, he was scoring the episode as it went on, uh, which is a fantastic thing. Uh, it's just fantastic. So, yeah, dark moments, uh, moments of, uh, of triumph and pain, desperation. Uh, it's Made in Abyss, baby. Like, to me, this is still Made in Abyss. This is still very much what this series has was originally setting out to do, right, is to tell these kinds of stories and deal with these types of themes. I just think that this episode happens to do it uh, a little bit darker, you know, kind of embracing those themes a bit more. And uh, I think it does it very well. I think it does it fantastically, to be honest. Uh, give me your thoughts on this week's episode of Made in Abyss. Let me know what you think of the darkness. What do you think of this, this 
disgusting stuff. I, 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 I can't imagine this is for everybody, right? I, I think at this point... I think if, if you got this far, I feel like you're in it to win it. You know, you're going to finish the series. But at the same time, I definitely would understand if someone was uh, very much turned off by a lot of the imagery in this episode. Uh, let me know how you felt about it. And was the manga worse? Is the manga even darker? I'm sure it is. I'm almost positive the manga is even darker than this. Uh, but to the anime only watchers, like, give me your thoughts on this stuff. You know, we're in this together. Uh, we got to help each other out. We got to we gotta discuss this stuff. Is Edom Yui uh, food? <laughs> Did we literally just eat a child? Did that happen in this episode? Uh, we need. I need to talk about this, guys. I need closure here. I need to discuss these things. Of course, no spoilers. I have to... Uh, have to preface that i don't want any spoilers i don't want to know but at the same time help me a little bit here <laughs> just help me a bit anyway guys thank you so very much for uh being a part of the conversation being a part of this video thank you so much for watching and uh as always party on